today's show where we've got we're talking to Sheila Newman um, and Sheila uh, last week we spoke to Gary Ebert mm -hmm. um, and we're talking to Sheila today who I guess is the other side of the fence in regards to um, the the development or the plan for future mm -hmm. development um, in Frankston. Um, we're going to be talking to Sheila about her thoughts on the proposed developments that are set to take shape in Frankston. Um, we're going to be talking about um, Sheila's views on if it's important to protect uh, Canook Creek and the Foreshore Reserve mm -hmm. um, and essentially why, why Sheila is passionate about this. And of course, we're going to have CJ's uh, market snapshot. Have you got a yep. suburb ready for today? I do. I'll give you some clues later. I really like this. I, I really like it's like it's like Quizmaster. <laughs> I really get into it. Um, so, Sheila, thank you for your time today. Hi, Sheila. Thank you for having me, Chrissy Ta and Adam. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about Sheila. Oh, gee. I don't often talk about Sheila. Um, I just know what I was here to talk about. Uh, um, well, I've lived here for um, uh, over 30 years. Uh, we Whereabouts? In Car Street, Frankston, in a yep. house built in the 1960s, really solid. Yep. Nothing blows off the roof <laughs> or anything. We sold in one in cars. Home. Yeah, sure did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Um, it went off, actually. Yeah. Popular mm. spot. Yeah. Uh, yes, obviously, because it's got lots of trees and uh, it's overlooking the sea and uh, probably because of the property uh, titles, the laws, the um, restrictive covenants, you've still got um, some large gardens and so on, mm. which um, will be very threatened by continuing growth pressure. So you've been there for 30 years? Slightly over, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're a Frankston resident through and through? For sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so the proposed developments um, in Frankston, um, so went through, there was a, a late stoppage from the planning minister, then obviously that's now been overturned and, and the developments are going ahead. What are your thoughts on the new proposed developments in Frankston? Um, okay, well, I've been watching this come towards us uh, for 30 years. I've been studying um, uh, the question of why we have this massive development being pushed and very rapid population growth in Australia. And um, I've been comparing our system to the French systems, which don't have rapid population growth. Um, uh, assisted by the government and so on and um, so looking at what's come coming our way I could recognise it immediately and I've got to say I find it nightmarish I suppose uh, on the ecological side um, that's one side but the other side is the um, self-determination the uh, democratic side the human rights side the ability people have to uh, have actually input into their government. Um, I, I'm really concerned that the local government here has basically um, signed over most local government powers to the state government. And that is, of course, not just for Frankston. Um, it's uh, the whole activity centre premise. Um, basically, local governments are approached by a big business model that's state-endorsed, a kind of... Um, big uh, private and corporate landlordism uh, and we're just asked, we we're told that we can no longer have any input into our city. There's a bit of a, a perimeter drawn around that that says, oh look, you can still sort of have a bit of a say um, uh, up the hill. Uh, but then of course the laws have changed again whereby people can build with uh, very little uh, um, restraint in their backyards and things now and that of course places enormous pressure on neighbourhoods that have attempted to keep trees and wildlife and have dogs and so on you know uh, I mean it just shows up in the fact that people surrender their pets all the time because they have nowhere to put them and they can't afford to feed them that's well known. So, so Sheila I yes. was gonna I was gonna ask then so obviously there's quite a few empty shops in in Frankston in the CBD yes. There are some people that are saying that um, this development 
is actually a good thing for the area. Is it possible, do you think, to strike a balance between the two to to have a, an outcome that is, you know, welcomed by everybody? Do you think that the in the in the Frankston, the actual activity zone, yeah. do you think that that high density development should happen there? Um, no, I, I look. I'll just answer your question first, Chrissy. Mm -hmm. um, the the shops are often empty because the rents are so high. You know, um, a shop owner, a small business person, has to pay the salaries for their employees to be able to afford to pay rent or mortgages, and the small business person also has to pay the rent or the mortgage on their business premises and their own house, home. And uh, because of the general trends to um, push up demand on housing and business premises, it is very difficult for anyone to do business in Australia. The rate of business failure is huge, but do look at the major cost of small business is rent, and that eats into the profit margin. It means that even medium and large size manufacturing enterprises in this country can't can't compete with overseas. Yeah, um, but Frankston countries. specifically is there is a high vacancy rate in comparison to other activity zone suburbs throughout yes, Melbourne. Yes, but the rents are still high and they're going to be much higher if you bring in higher density because what you do, I mean, of course you know this, if you, it's, it's like going in a supermarket shelf when you look at the prices of cheese, you know, um, say, or bacon, say you choose to buy cheese and how do you choose between the feta cheeses? Well, you might look at the label that says how much you're paying per gram, per 100 grams, and that will tell you whether you're paying, say, twice as much for this cheese or, or, or half that much for that cheese. Well, we really need labels like that on high density living because the more you can build on a block, the higher the cost per square metre. Um, and uh, the less you get for that cost. You don't get gardens, uh, you lose control over a lot of your built environment, like um, you have body corporates who, um, if you can't pay them, you have to move on. You know, it's, it gets very arbitrary. And of course, um, uh, I'm just going, have I gone off track? I mean, uh, I could talk about the but, body corporate problems, but, but, but basically it drives up costs and there's no guarantee of any affordable housing. I mean, at the planning hearing most recently on the C160 Fran, the, um, the chairman, when somebody was talking about affordable housing, one of the submitters um, uh, said, well, no, look, we can't guarantee, there's no guarantee for affordable housing because, frankly, we can't make the developers do it. He said the only way you can sometimes get a developer to do a little bit of affordable housing is if you give in on something else. So we're being sold a heck of a lie. Now, I'm sure by who? many people by the state government... By who? By the state government and the property developers that it has outsourced most of its planning regulation to, such regulation as remains because there's very little. So, so back to the, the question in regards to uh, commercial vacancies, yes. will more people being in the Frankston activity zone living, um, surely that will um, help improve the amount of empty shop fronts one would assume that are currently in Frankston would you would you would you say that I don't think so because there will be more shop fronts anyway at the base of the so-called towers um, and I mean the main problem is the lack of competitiveness because of profit margins and costs in Australian businesses and the internet traffic I mean, we even buy and sell our property and our land over the internet and people sure, I guess the only thing we've been told about in this prospective plan, and I have of course read it because I made my own submission and I appeared um, at the hearing, is you know, people will have um, a very edgy and what's the term, vibrant life, drinking coffee and presumably um, uh, uh, drinking alcohol and sitting under umbrellas uh, around the perimeter of the dark towers where there'll be a bit of light. Um, I mean, uh, people can't afford to employ staff to serve coffee, so I don't know where that's going. Look, quite frankly, um, we've just seen this, like Sydney, nobody can get a coffee after four o'clock. I mean, you're lucky if you can get lunch in Sydney because nobody can afford to pay the staff. 
this is what's going to be happening to the only local businesses that you might think would happen, like pubs and, and coffee. Um, I mean, what else? We could all invest in car parks, so high-rise car parks. If only we had a public high-rise car park where we all got a share, we'd all be rich, you know. We could just build them everywhere and join in. Mm. Maybe sleep there eventually when we all really go to riding bicycles, which is the other thing that we're being told will happen. Yet we're building these high... I mean, it's all... What's the polite word? I mean, I know some people believe this, but I don't. I don't think... Most of the people involved in it do, and I certainly don't think the state government does. And yet they're don't going believe, to take over. Don't believe Sorry, what? Yes. Don't believe what? They don't believe this stuff about cheaper housing and everybody's going to ride bicycles and um, uh, there'll be more jobs. It's going to be corporate stuff too, and the corporates are invested in this. So insurance, um, maybe... There, are, there, there will unquestionably be more jobs because you've got more people living in the... Frankston um, activity zone. Not so there's going to be more businesses, there's going to be more consumers, there's going to be more activity. Uh, yes, but there's not going to be any more of anything. What do you mean? Well, I mean, we're not actually making more um, stuff for parks or wildlife. Everybody's going to be squeezed into smaller places competing mm. for just doing the same stuff, the same coffees. Well, when you're talking about... Yeah pricing and affordable pricing. And buying it over the internet, of course. Sorry, go on. Yes. Yeah. When you talk about affordable, um, uh, you know, the, the, the price of the assets, at the end of the day, that's just all supply and demand. So yeah. if there's a demand for the assets at that price point, then ultimately that's just what they're going to sell for. Because, um, yes. you know, as time goes on, in my experience, and I've been in you know in real estate for close to three decades. Um, people's wants and needs have changed. So when I first started, everybody wanted the quarter of an acre, you know, the big block and the, the kids to run around. Where now you talk about the internet, um, lives are different now. So a lot of people want the low maintenance lifestyle because the 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 they just they don't want the yard they don't want the space so is it not a, a, a good thing that it that I, I agree there shouldn't be high density developments as you go further out of the activity zone but is it not a good thing to give people the option to if they want that low maintenance um, lifestyle for them to have the option to to accommodate that well, look, I disagree with you anyway. I think people have been uh, kind of uh, forced into a situation where they have very little choice. Uh, but I know it's presented to the general public that our, our desires have changed. But how but can you disagree with me when, you, when this is what I do for a living? Uh, like, I, I'm in yeah. people's houses. So well, I, I, I I'm, speak... I'm about to tell you. Yeah. So people have been put in a position where they can't really choose and they've also uh, been, uh, their perception of reality has been massaged by um, a, a mainstream press, you know, the Age and the Murdoch press, that have bigproperty.coms and they basically tell us what they want us to think everybody else thinks. How many of us talk to each other? We're very isolated, but I can tell you that most people actually would like big houses and big gardens. There are some people who, have, who place very little value on sunlight and nature and having pets and things, but many of us are pushed into just continuous commuting. Consider the rate of divorce and how people finish up having their properties divided. I mean, they don't have the choice. And so I don't think there's more choice. And of course, you know, I was alluding to the whole um, high rise living the downsizing thing. I mean, do you know how I came by to buy my house? I bought it in 1992, I think it was, when Frankston was a cheap suburb, when South Frankston was a cheap suburb, when that was the norm. Only 30 it's, odd Frankston years ago. is still, a, a, a still a, an extremely affordable suburb. Not if you come from France where you can buy um, a flat in Paris for... But we're not talking about that. We're talking about metropolitan Melbourne. Well, and, we're, uh, and, uh, and, and we're saying that Frankston, if you're talking about average selling prices, Frankston is still extraordinarily affordable in comparison to other suburbs in Melbourne. Yes, but Australia as, as a country is an... 
incredibly unaffordable um, place to live. It's ridiculously so. So I mean, and and it's all coming down us. I mean, you you exacerbate the um, density uh, per square meter in Frankston, and not only will all our rates go up, but so will all the prices go up. And that's fine if you're just into buying and selling and buying and selling, or if you want to live in your car and rent your house out or something. But it's no good if you want to enjoy life mm. um, where you are. So. Um, your question was, um, uh, you were initially saying that, uh, oh, no, I wanted to tell you how I came by my house, if I can. Yeah, absolutely. Hold that thought for two seconds. Right. We can have a few words from our sponsors and we will be right back. And Sheila's going to let us know how she found her house okay. in- And why. Ra and why. In but that one's okay. Something a bit, yeah. yeah. That, that's a good song. <laughs> it's a good song. Um, okay, so Sheila, so. Tell us your story about your house in Frankston. Right. Well, we bought it in the uh, early 1990s, my mother and I, because my mother was living in Sydney uh, where she'd had to downsize after my father's business failed and the mortgage bit the dust. And um, oh, they, they went fire Melbourne and then to Canada as landed immigrants. Then they came back here and they got a flat in North Sydney and they couldn't afford the body corporate fees. That's it. They were in their 60s. They didn't have a, the income of a young person and they were constantly asked to meet the expectations of people in a higher wage bracket that they had been in when they bought. Um, and so my mother asked me if I would buy with her in Victoria where I was living. Mm -hmm. And so we went looking for houses and with the sale of the flat in Sydney, uh, she was able to put the bulk of the money into the house we bought in Car Street. Um, so, you know, this is a personal experience of downsizing. There are many, many pitfalls. Those are not the only charges. People lose control of, um, of their environment. They finish up paying for shoddy work like bad cladding and so on, and they have to move out and they can't even sell and rent. And so we have very bad building standards. Sheila, did yes. your family share your views? I'm just curious about where do you think they've originated from? My view? Yeah, on, on development, um, housing, all of that. Well, you know, the back way back when, my mother was from Irish immigrant stock. And of course, the Irish lost all their land to Elizabeth I, to Cromwell, and then to just successive waves of uh, brutal British um, settlers who were pushed, pushed the Catholics to the north of Ireland and, you know, chased them into the swamps and burned them alive and so on. And so I think people with a memory of that and some knowledge of history realise how bad land speculation can be. And that's what we've got in Australia, just the British model of... Mm. Um, so I was aware of that. But as a child, we moved from place to place. It was very difficult. Um, for I kept going to different schools and things. So I really valued a house. And my mother the same. She she finished up being responsible for most finances and she had enormous difficulty getting a house. Um, and so, yeah, I was really glad to be able to buy with my parents. We used to have border clashes in the kitchen and so on. No. But they'd lived overseas for years. Yeah. And, you know, but yeah. um, we did that from necessity and it's a model that many people have to do um, and it is unfortunate that Australians are so so disorganised through commuting and divorce and infilling and having to move to find somewhere to live um, that they can't really organise to represent themselves anymore and they don't talk to their neighbours they don't actually know what they think anymore they just know what they have to do and they know what they're told to think or told that they think that they should think by the mass media. So um, I, um, and I suppose um, it was, I was going to some of my favorite places in Victoria, like Cape Lip Trap, um, uh, like 40 years ago. And I just saw that there was all this building going on where there had be, been farms and wild spaces and there were rabbits everywhere. They were no longer being controlled. And I could just see there was this push coming from God knows where. And I thought, where is this coming from? So eventually I went back to university and did um, an MA by research in sociology. And the question was, why do we have this growthism in Australia but not in France? This, 
And I realised it was because um, it is possible for people to organise to earn money through property speculation. They know each other, they know how to do it. But the rest of Australia doesn't know where it's coming from. We're not benefiting from it. We pay for it. So you've got, you know, the Property Council of Australia basically runs this country, I think. Uh, that's your peak body. But, I mean, it started with APOP in Victoria. I don't know if you're aware of APOP, capital A, capital P, O, P. And they had this idea of having, you know, 150 million, 200 million people in Australia and big cities all around the country. Well. My father was a geophysicist. I lived with little Aborigines or played with them in Western Australia on geophysical safari. I know this country is very dry. I also know it's very beautiful. It has, uh, even in the desert, you have such a wide variety of, of animals and plants. And, uh, and it, on the peninsula, my God, the peninsula still has about mm, a bit over 2,000 kangaroos, I think. You should talk to uh, Craig Thompson. Do you, do you know him? Uh, he does the um, the kangaroo walks up on uh, God, what's it? Uh, up in uh, on Arthur's Seat. Yeah. Or to um, uh, Michelle Thompson, who uh, uh, rescues koalas and things. She's at Animalia in Frankston. I mean, there are so many animals being injured. There's no the doubt, and and look, there's no doubt that the peninsula is uh, it's a beautiful place oh, to live, and we've got some yeah, yeah the the nature and and the scenery and and all of that. Are you do you acknowledge that maybe not everybody um, is after? Do you know what I mean? That not only feels as strongly, but that 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 kind of lifestyle may not be for everyone as as adam mentioned earlier that some people are looking for low maintenance living or they prefer that city type you do do you acknowledge that well look there are people who are pretty deaf dumb and blind to nature you know they don't know they don't get what a magpie is for you know what's this silly creature on two legs for what, what is it for but everybody's different doesn't yes everybody's different but yeah. the thing is the um the ecology is life itself. We 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 cannot repair anything except through life. But we're not talking. But the development isn't isn't. Ta- it's it's in the activity zone. That's where the high rise developments taking place. It's not happening in um, national park or. Oh, hang you, on! But you, it is uh, because well, it is actually. You know, there are plenty of uh, attempts to develop the national parks and privatize them. But the high rises have a footprint. I mean. The high rises don't have farms in them, but you still need farms for the people in them. They don't have lakes in them, but you still need water for the people in them. They don't have coal in them, but you still need coal and wind farms and so on for the people in them. Uh, all that comes from kangaroo habitat and so on. And so those are you, concrete towers... So are you flying the flag then for mm-hmm. for all of Australia based on the fact that you live in Frankston? Is that what you're sort of saying? You're anti-Frankston development, but your, your, your view on it is bigger. It's anti-development anywhere. Is that what you're saying? Um, well, uh, I mean, what's happening in Frankston is happening in every capital city and in many regional places uh, in Australia. So this is just um, a, a cookie cutter trend. So, but yeah, but are you saying that your views are staunch Frankston views, or are you saying you're anti-development across all of Australia? Um, uh, well, I mean, I suppose that is what I'm saying. I don't think we should keep growing. I think we're doing very poor buildings. We are using massive energy. We're rolling out forty percent carbon gases emissions just from the concrete you know everything so what are your views on imi- dangerous what are your views on immigration my views on immigration is too much mm. i mean 0.5 percent sorry 0.5 percent of of population growth in australia currently is endogenous that is from people here two percent is from overseas migration now 2.5 percent uh, means doubling of the population in less than 30 years. So do you do you actively have this viewpoint in other 
council areas or just because you live in Frankston, you've set your targets on Frankston? Hang on. Um, when you say a viewpoint, I mean, I am a scientist. Yeah. And I think we're doing very dangerous stuff mm. politically. We, we don't have a say in anything. And uh, just environmentally, you know, we're looking at extreme poverty, starvation and thirst, not just for our Indigenous animals, but for people. Because we're going to hit 150 million at this rate within the lifetime of a child that's about eight years old today. And most people don't even understand what, what are we now, 27 million? Or was, was it 28 we turned the other day? Draw a circle around there, mm. yeah. I, I, got, I started to worry when we were at uh, 17 million, and that wasn't very long ago. So um, uh, I don't think most people have any idea Firstly, of what the population is. Secondly, of the pop what the population growth is. Thirdly, of how it, it is composed in terms of numbers. And fourthly, of how rapidly it grows and also of the inertia it develops. The inertia being, um, you know, when you get a big thing going fast, it's hard to stop it. And with people, I mean, anyway, so there you go. Cannonook Creek. Yes, let's get to Cannonook Creek. So, and the foreshore reserve. So, the why? So, do you? I guess the the question that I've, that um, that is on this sheet here in front of me is: So, you think it's important to protect Cannonook Creek Reserve, and how do you think the developments are going to affect Cannonook Creek? Um, yeah, um, I think it's tremendously important. I, I can tell you why aesthetically. I mean, do you know Cannonook Creek? Of course. Mm -hmm. So um, from my point of view, possibly not for yours, but I've kayaked down it and I often walk like several times a week along Cannonock Creek and just about all the other wild spaces I take turns. It's, it's a beautiful place. It's like, I don't know if you're familiar with that book that was written in the 20th or was in the early 20th century, The Wind in the Willows. Oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. So it, it's just a, a remarkable picturesque place that's been there for a long time where people have led very individual lives. There's individual building. It's higgledy-piggledy. It's interesting. I'm also a landscape painter, so um, it appeals to me there. I mean, the shapes are unpredictable. There's a lot of light in it um, and shade. So humans really enjoy that play of light and shade. When you walk there in the evening um, from the city end, you get this amazing light play as the sun goes down. And there are so many trees along it that it's like it looks as though it's unchanged since pre-European times. It is so beautiful and it's got all these bridges crossing it and little little boats tied up to the little jetties and there's no pretension about and it. And how will that change? Well, um, it's going to be concreted in the more in the um, city area um, and that will and there will be many more people. Um, there will be uh, more concrete along the banks just because they tend to sell it to the council of last. Could it be? Concrete. Could it be that more people to enjoy it though? Well, look, the more people you have in a natural setting, the quicker it gets damaged. So there are enough people to enjoy it now. With regard to uh, the sunlight, um, well, there, there's, um, there will be restricted sunlight on the creek. There's an argument that there'll be enough sunlight. But it will make it colder. It will change um, the conditions for animals. Um, it will change the conditions for uh, the sea grasses, which actually nurture a number of uh, endangered animals. There is one other thing most people don't realise. The uh, Victorian government has been criticised by the Attorney General for failing s over decades to honour its obligations under the Flora and Fauna Act. So, you know, before it does that, it shouldn't be building anything. Sorry, did, go on. I yes. heard something during the week that uh, that the planning approval um, for one of those buildings in particular was originally. I'm not sure if this is correct, but was originally approved for offices, so for business use, and it was so the same same um, same amount of stories but it wasn't residential, it was purely commercial. So would you have had a problem with that if it was people working there? 
Um, yeah, I have a problem with a great big uh, building uh, right on the creek um, squashing down into earth that was once swamp. And I've got to say that just um, looking at the whole planning for this um, activity centre, mm. I look at it and I've sat through hours and hours of nonsense from planners and their lawyers. Um, and really what I retain from that is someone got the catbird seat Whoever got those big towers on the foreshore, nobody's going to build in front of them. And they're, they're in front of everybody else's view. And it looks to me like the whole thing benefits the people sitting on the foreshore with their great big um, tower. I, that's what it looks like, the whole thing. It doesn't make any sense with all the... the, the just the argy bargy about the details of the development, which has very little detail, it's very blurred. In the end, it boils down to someone is going to be lucky and they're going to have unassailable values on that real estate. And everybody else behind is waiting in the queue, like people in, in a theatre with these big fat people standing up at the front. And I think that's totally unjustifiable. Mm. Anyway, so thank you to Sheila, who's now left the studio. Uh, thank you for her interesting uh, views yeah, yeah. on the um, development, development in Frankston. Yeah. So thank you for your time today, Sheila.